Hi guys, uh, yeah. it's very good to meet everyone this evening. Uh, my name is Bonk, uh, and uh, I'm a developer relations program manager from Google, uh, based in Singapore and Thailand. Uh, I take care of the Thailand and Malaysia market, uh, so I have my colleague and my teammate right at the back of the room, uh, Mani, to take care of uh, Singapore developers. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, do share Mani, look up to me. Uh, I guess you speak Thai. <laughs> Uh, so basically today, uh, just before I start, I just want to just throw it out there. Uh, Gig Alert, uh, this deck has a couple of slides with code. I'm sure that you guys are, are basically used to see code inside. So uh, this evening, I just want to talk uh, about a short story of progression. Uh, and, and I just want to walk you through uh, exactly the uh, experience of mine when I come, uh, how I come about formulating this talk. Um, so, uh, what happened was that last week I had to deliver a session uh, in Bangkok, uh, in one of the events called IREF Standard 2016 Bangkok, and that was like, and two days before the event, I really don't know what I want to talk about. I know I want to deliver a web session, but I really don't know, I have no idea what, uh, what my thoughts are. So, am I going to be talking about progressive web apps alone, uh, maybe? Uh, then there's also Firebase for web. Uh, so if you guys haven't seen Firebase, uh, just go to firebase.google.com. Uh, it's a new product we rolled out this year. It's, it's amazing. Uh, it's a lot of tools, uh, and you can basically use it to build uh, synchronization, synchronized apps, by like, imagine chat and things like that, uh, that synchronize across various devices in real time. So I was thinking, maybe we should talk about Firebase as well, since uh, it's a new product, you know, no one does about it, so maybe I should talk about it. But then there's also material design. <coughs> Should I talk about material design for web? Uh, now I'm starting to get really confused. There's so many things to talk about, right? Uh, and then, lastly, there's Angular 2, which just launched. And when I get to this point, I say, like, holy shit, this is getting a bit too much. My head is, you know, it's going haywire. So what I did, uh, and I was at the airport, actually, uh, waiting for my flight to Bangkok. So what I did was that, you know, for inspiration, I just want to pull out my phone and start loading the event agenda just to get some inspiration from the other speakers. Uh, and this happens. Uh, I get the, the really cute little dinosaur uh, you know, on my screen, on my mobile phone, uh, and when I get this one, I'll say, oh, holy shit, I'm really screwed. Uh, I really have no inspiration, I don't know what to talk about. But, I, but then I thought that I was connected because there's the uh, airport Wi Fi, right? uh, And that's when I realized I found into a situation which I call Live Fi. Uh, so we have Wi-Fi, uh, we have offline, and we have Wi-Fi. Anyone here familiar with Wi-Fi? Familiar? Okay. Because so when I ask anyone familiar with Wi-Fi in Bangkok, no one shakes their head, so I assume they are always connected. <laughs> but it seems like the infrastructure is better than us. Oh well. So uh, this actually came on a light, light bulb moment. I was like, oh, okay. I, I suddenly had an idea. Right? And the idea is that maybe I should talk about uh, my deliberate journey in developing a, an app, a demo app, for the event that works offline, that signifies ways to get data, uh, and also uses the material design and UI components. Uh, so it's a pretty good talk. Right? I think I'm, I'm heading down the right track here. So the first thing I did, and being very lazy, and it seems that every developer found me to can't finish for some, for some very weird reason, I don't know why. <laughs> So I started, uh, and this is really awesome. If you haven't fly with Singapore Airlines before, just fly with Singapore Airlines. Because you get Wi Fi on the So I started doing this. I started doing some research, and you know, I said, hey, okay, maybe Angular allows me to build more apps really easy. Uh, so I started doing and, and Angular 2 actually does allow me to build uh, more apps really easy because they have this uh, Angular World toolkit. Uh, so just before I go on, anyone used Angular before? Oh, nice. I'm so happy. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone use Angular 2 before? Uh, okay. At least, at least you guys won't know if I'm, I'm actually talking shit. <laughs> so, Angular World Toolkit. Uh, when I saw this, I was like, awesome. Right, I can use this. Uh, I only got like two hours uh, to complete my demo. I should be able to do this. So, I started downloading and I started, you know, installing. I know, sorry, anyway, this is me, very happy with that, I saw this. And then when I started downloading and I saw this, I said, oh my god, 
there's no way I'm going to complete my demo. And, and the reason behind it is that, you know, we web developers, we use a lot of open source tools, uh, and we use a lot of uh, NPM to manage our packages, so somehow on my device, on my laptop, some dependency is actually conflicting. So, oh well, <sighs> this is not good, and I'm really getting nervous. I'm seriously getting nervous to this. So I said I keep calm and carry on, and uh, start reviewing the requirements for my demo web. Uh, I really decided I want to develop Angular 2, uh, I want to synchronize using Firebase, with the design of my neighbor. Okay, cool now, these other features, we can do this, we can do this, all right, let's go on. Right. So the first thing I do was I go to firebase.google.com, and I set up, uh, and if you guys want to think about all the API keys, do it right now, it's free to use. Uh, it's recorded, that's fine, uh, uh, before I actually uh, close it out, but yeah. The first thing I did was I go to firebase.google.com uh, and I and I start setting up my my firebase database. Uh, and the firebase database is very similar to very similar to Meteor, I think. I haven't used Meteor as yet, but it's a NoSQL uh, cloud database as well, and everything you find here is basically in JSON format. Uh, so very quickly, I just put I just pump in a couple of demo data, uh, and then I got this done. I just in the back. Just and then I'm going to copy all of this, um, and then just put it into my notepad or whatever. And the next thing I, I want to do is I want to install uh, Angular 2, right? So Angular 2 has a very awesome tool called Angular Dash CLI, uh, and then it uses npm as well. So install it using npm, uh, and then I decided to create a new project uh, called and, and I ran this from an NGPU IO 2016, and then it creates all the necessary code structure from it, and I do ng serve. And that's, that's the nerve-wracking moment, because if everything goes well, uh, I got this. Right, it has a local server, uh, you can put it up uh, after you run NGSERP. And when I saw this, I was really happy. Right, so let's move on. So then I installed the Angular Fire Library, uh, which allows me to talk to the Firebase uh, backend uh, through the Angular 2 uh, interface and handle all the data bindings and whatsoever. So I didn't do npm install and then I do the that firebase, uh, that's just safe, that's me the npm package, and I start configuring now. Uh, so if you've not worked with uh, Angular 2 before, or if you're not familiar with TypeScript, uh, Angular 2 uses TypeScript. Uh, so uh, don't worry about the syntax too much, but uh, just to show that, you know, all I did was I import the firebase provider, uh, and then I pump in all the details, so this is another chance for you to take down all the keys that can use my database. Then after that, um, I set up in the main component. Uh, and the main component is sort of like the, the run function of the app. Uh, so what I did was that I would say, you know, uh, declare a variable for sessions, which is of type Firebase is uh, observable. Uh, and that actually handles all the data value. Right. And then in the constructor, I just call af.database.list sessions and grabs all the data on Firebase. And that's it. Right. You leave it as that. Anytime when there's new data in Firebase, uh, in the Firebase uh, database, that's a long vista. Firebase database, uh, Firebase actually push it out to your client. You don't have to write any more code. Right? It automates synchronize. Mm, so in display, uh, all the data is also very easy. Uh, and you also have all these directives, like MG4, like it doesn't follow, so you can read templating systems and uh, find any data writing. This is how you, you're going to be very really comfortable in this. Uh, programming uh, syntax. Right. So all I do is that I just loop in every session and I just want to print out the file just to test it out. So uh, by the time I got to this stage, I uh, it works, right? So that's that's how uh, I just want to show that's how the UI looks like uh, when you're running uh, you know the local web, the local web server to test your Angular app, and uh, basically that's that's getting the data from from Firebase. I put that in. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with the, the mobile view in Chrome. Awesome design view. Awesome. Grab your Chrome stickers before you decided to change the logo or even duplicate Chrome. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, the reason why I want to call it a view is uh, I don't want to talk a little bit about responsive design as well. Um, so, thank you this stage. Awesome. But can we do, is, is this really, this, this doesn't look good, right? Like you pass this to your to your boss, your boss will say that that's fine, thank you for the service. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So it's a little bit more, and we can definitely do better. So we are developers, we, we have the power to do better. So I then decided to make it pretty, right? And that's where material design comes in. Um, so material design is just a design framework, uh, just for you to actually uh, set a guidelines for you to think about how you want to structure your, your UI, so it works nicely across your different devices. Okay. And the nice thing about Angular is that we have uh, Angular material, which is another library, right? And off I went, but yeah, that's me again. <laughs> off I went to kind of get, you know, install this. Right, so I uh, run an npm install, and get to material. Uh, and the nice thing about this life is that it's modularized. So you, you know, something to do with CSS frameworks, you kind of download the entire CSS, and then you pick what you want, right? But uh, for Angular material, you can actually pick exactly what components you want, and then download those. Uh, only, right? So you kind of don't block your, your application. So I just download a couple of uh, buttons, uh, card, calls, things like that. And once you download it in your HTML, you can start using it uh, because it has all those HTML directives, right? So uh, I did a uh, site nav layout, uh, site nav, which is the, the menu that comes in from the, the left hand side, uh, and also two by the top. And then I display everything in card form. So when I do this, everything looks well, and it now looks like this. It's so much better. Right? At least I feel good about myself. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so when I get to this stage, I was thinking like, okay, maybe this is this is it. Uh, but then I got reminded, I need to, I need to make it offline enable, and we can definitely do better. Let's push the boundary a little bit more. Right? We can do better. Um, so I don't remember this. My angle is burn this, right? <laughs> and make it this, right? Even though it's live, live, offline, whatsoever. So, uh, what happens here? I have to need to make this offline workable. So, in case the message isn't clear. <laughs> so, we need to do two things. Uh, one is that we need to structure our app a little bit. Uh, think about uh, how we want to uh, make this online and what, what concept. One concept that you can leverage is the app shell concept. Uh, the app shell concept is very simple. Uh, just think about what all the files you need for your web app to run offline. So the JavaScript, the images, you know, HTML, uh, your CSS, all the stuff, just uh, basically take note of them. And then anything else that loads is the content, right? It's the dynamic content. So the first step is to cache all of this. So find a way to cache all of this so when the browser launches, Without Wi-Fi, uh, at least the browser can get it to cache. Right? So that's the F shell concept. Uh, and to cache all of this, we actually need service worker. Uh, who has worked with service workers before? Nice, one, two, three. Okay, cool. So service worker is a, is a, uh, is a new feature. Some relatively new, I would say. It's been around for a while, actually. Uh, 2014, it started. Uh, that was introduced in all the major browsers. Absent Safari. <laughs> uh, so, um, but the last thing is that uh, Safari actually tweeted, uh, I think last two weeks, saying that you know, they, they are seriously looking into this. Uh, so that's good news, right? And I'll talk a little bit about Safari later on. It's on, it's on video or something. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so this, the most important thing does is that it actually runs in the background. It's a JavaScript file that runs in the background, even if your app is not open. Uh, and what you can do is that you use service worker to intercept every single HTTP request, right? And the last thing about this is imagine what we can do in terms of caching. Every request that goes to the server, right? When it comes back, you use service worker to listen to the response from the server, and then you grab that file, whatever content that's written by the server, and put it into the cache of the browser, right? So browser these days have NSDB, cache storage, local storage, so on and so forth. Right, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take, we're going to do service worker to do exactly that. Um, and again, me being lazy, I started looking for tools. And that's the beauty of web developers, right? There are tons of tools out there. So I came across this. And yeah, that's me again. Uh, up and down, very emotional uh, flight. Uh, and, and then I came across this tool called SW-P cache. Right? Uh, and what this still does is that it's really cool. It, it, it actually uh, probably a command line tool that auto-generates the, the service worker JavaScript. Uh, so you don't have to do anything. 
Uh, and after you generate the JavaScript, uh, all you have to do is just in the JavaScript itself, there's an array, you just put in all the file names of the things that you want to cache. And that's it. Right? And then what you need, oh yeah, these are the steps. So you install it, uh, and then you use Gulp to generate the service worker like this. Yes. Uh, anyone work with Gulp before? Okay, cool. Couple. For those of you who haven't worked with Gulp before, it's actually something very similar to, uh, to a build tool. Uh, that auto generates some tasks, it gives some tasks, it generates, uh, it, it just executes whatever tasks it gives it. Uh, so, basically, use Gulp to generate a, a service worker of genus. Uh, and, and that's how it's been done. So, it's generating, 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 generating. And then you, in your HTML, in your HTML, you go in the script block. You register it, right? You register uh, with the browser that this is a service worker script. And then if everything works, you know, everything whatsoever a uh, setup is done actually, uh, you give it the necessary files, you eventually reach this. Um, so I just want to jump on my slide and show you something, uh, a real life example. Um, so I learned my lesson in showing my own demo. Uh, under a very short period of time, it always fails. So I'm going to show someone else's demo. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what you have here, and if it fails, it's not my fault. <laughs> so what we have here is really an uh, uh, application that was built by the Polymer team. Uh, and the Polymer team is another set of framework uh, from Google as well. Uh, and, it's, and you notice that it, I'm actually offline, right? Uh, it's, it's sort of like a, an online shop that allows me to shop for Google merchandise uh, clothing. And it's offline, and I still can browse, right? I still can add to cart, right? I still view the cart. Uh, I just gonna check out, uh, I don't, uh, and I can go back, you know, look at another section, uh, and all these things are available even offline. So you can imagine the experience that you can give to your users, right? And when you come online, uh, they can resume whatever experience they left off, right? And one really interesting use case uh, that was being showcased in the PWA uh, summit in Amsterdam last week was that a uh, country in South Africa, uh, sorry, not a country, <laughs> a company <laughs> in South Africa. Um, build a PWA app that allows them to have an offline checkout workflow. So if it's offline, uh, you do checkout, the app calls the company to complete the checkout, which is really, really cool. Right? So imagine you're not using, losing customers. You know, whatever, the offline, Wi-Fi, online, you'll just be able to buy yourself. Um, so, yeah, and, and what is done is that, remember I was talking about caching, uh, the actually uses, this app actually uses cache storage. So it comes in all the files in there, right? So even it's offline, the uh, service worker will just pull out all the files from, from the cache. So that's the demo. Uh, and let me just go back to my side. And again. Um, so let's recap what we have done, right? Uh, progressively, uh, we set up database, we install Angular 2, we install Angular 5 2, we install Angular Design, uh, we then install the, the tool to generate the service worker JS. We generate the search for the JS, we register it, and we enable the web app offline. Uh, so that's just a quick run through of what we have discussed today. Um, but then we can actually do way more. There are more things that we can do. We can add a web manifest file. Uh, so if you have a mobile phone, and then you can actually add to your, the, the web app to your, to your home screen. And then when it launches, it kind of behaves like a native app, especially if offline, right? So it kind of builds like a native app. Uh, you can actually use uh, the web push notification API uh, and also the Firebase Cloud message uh, to push uh, notification out to your users uh, when you're browsing on mobile phone. Uh, so it's really, really cool. Uh, and right now, as developers, you know, we're getting power with all those amazing tools where you can really enhance the user experience. Um, so I just want to take a step back, you know, when, when a lot of people talk about progressive web app, they can not say that progressive web app is a web, uh, web application that install a mobile phone that gives you the native app experience. But it's actually more than that. Uh, it's actually a concept that you progressively enhance the user experience. Right. So earlier on when I was saying that Safari doesn't support service workers, so obviously you can't have it work offline. But all those concepts that you've learned uh, earlier on, like again responsive or basically, uh, you know, what else do you learn? <laughs> But all those things that you can do in order to improve the user experience, 
taking advantage of all the, the uh, all the browser's uh, latest features, uh, you're actually doing uh, the user a great, uh, a great favor because you're progressively enhancing the user experience. Uh, so it's really about the concept. So uh, not so much. Uh, so even if somebody didn't support it, uh, they will still benefit from whatever you've done to, to your web app. So um, if you want to learn more, uh, there's, a, there's a user database, right? Uh, and this event was happen, it happened like uh, two weeks ago in Amsterdam. Uh, the school space has a lot of amazing talks. Uh, there's one talk about streaming HTML content, which is sort of like a new feature that we have in uh, browser too soon. So instead of loading one whole HTML page uh, to HTTP, uh, what it allows you to do is that the first byte that is being retrieved from the server, it streams to the browser and it really can display uh, the content. So there's a talk about that as well. Uh, so check that out, it's really cool. And I think that's about it. So, uh, just do we have time for questions? We have five minutes for questions. Please don't worry. <coughs> uh, okay, so, oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Is your file name hosted on Firebase as well, or is it just a database? So, we do have uh, Firebase hosting. Uh, you can actually upload all your uh, HTML, JavaScript, uh, CSS, all to Firebase hosting. Yeah. No, how long did it take to load your web app? For this one? Yes. This one it takes rather fast because I rarely need the data. But when, when you cache it, right? In terms of value, so. Is it less than one minute? Or? Uh, maybe less than a second. Oh. Yeah. It's, I mean, just in the context of this demo, uh, it's, it's just because they have very little data. But the interesting, your, your question is actually very interesting. So, there's a, if you check out the playlist, they actually did a comparison. Right. If you load it from cache, and they did a comparison between loading it from cache versus a native app. And it's actually quite comparable, and sometimes beating a native app when you first load. But how about initial loading? Initial loading uh, yeah. depends Wait, on your app, actually. Yeah. So for yours, uh, yours, also few seconds? For me, it's very good. Uh, just because it's then so it's so small. Yeah. But that's the best thing about it, right? You can start thinking about how you want to optimize it. Uh, and then you can start really reducing it. And that's one metric for PLA, is the time to first load. Right? So let's reduce it to whatever you feel uh, satisfies, and then uh, basically hopefully meet your quality standards. Any other questions? Will the web replace uh, native, apps? native apps? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I love them. They will definitely outlive them. Oh, sorry? They will definitely outlive them. Yeah, precisely. That's the point. Anybody yeah. remember Simeon? You. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have the ex-Nokia employee actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so I would say the web has been around longer than than, uh, than the new apps. Uh, each has its own, obviously, has its own uh, strength, but the web has its reach, right? So, for example, if I want to, if I want you to use my app, on the, if I'm on the, on the web, I send you a link. You load it. You edit the home screen, that's it. You got the user. But if you want, if you have a native app, you need to tell me the name, you need to go to the just store, search for the app, download, and wait for the app to download and then install. So for, for countries which is data sensitive, uh, it, it's very expensive and it's a lot to ask your users. Like sometimes you know, let's say 10 map could be ten dollars, and just before they, they use your app, they're already paying for it. So so that so in, in this cases, I think PLA kind of makes more sense for data center countries. How much money? Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, I think that's okay. Do, do you notice a performance difference between using Safari and Base Chrome? No, no. I'm interested to know how uh, do you host uh, on the Firebase hosting there? Is it something like it pulls from a Git, Git repo? Uh, or is there something like that? Okay, so it's basically uh, you just deploy. It's a deployment model. So you don't have versioning. 
Ah, yeah, bank command line. Yes, bank command line. So it doesn't have versioning like GitHub, unfortunately. Uh, it's very lightweight uh, and also a solution. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, you have a question? Well, when you were in the cache data, you talked about receiving a session after the user gets the expected session back. Uh, how do you deal with potential uh, conflicts in the data? Like, let's say with a store demo, if the prices have changed or stock has changed, how uh, uh, long do the users offline? Yeah, so one of the strategy is timestamp. Always timestamp everything that you you actually cache it. And then when you kind of go online, when you, when you pass the data back to the server, you compare the timestamp. Uh, it takes a little bit more work. Uh, the good thing about Firebase is that it actually do for you, uh, does that uh, automatically for you. So conflict resolution is handled. Uh, because uh, when you download the Firebase SDK, the JavaScript SDK included, every data that you save, I then show write to Firebase, I then show read. But when you run data back to Firebase and it goes offline, you actually timestamp it and you cache it. Uh, when, you go off, when you go online, you can compare the timestamp. Just hold on a second. Do we have time? Uh, last question. Last question. What happens to a user session in that case? Ah, good question. You have to handle it yourself. There's a lot of value solutions to it, but naturally, uh, yeah, you have to handle it yourself. And I think that's it. Yeah, thank you for being such an uh, awesome audience. Uh, yeah, there's one more thing. So uh, we have this program, at least that's a plug. We have this program called Word of the Experts. Uh, it's, a, it's a really nice program you know, for people that have really uh, some expertise around the web, around mobile, and things like that. If you want to know more, uh, yeah, do reach out to Mani. Uh, he's in charge of the program in Singapore. Uh, you speak Thai and you and you're here to visit, uh, talk to me. Uh, I usually I, I take a panel. So. <laughs> Alright, yeah, thanks a lot again. Thank you.